Hello, everybody. Welcome to Comfort Legacies with Faye Michelle. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing my lovely husband, Carl Douglas. And today, he's going to be sharing some of his um, adventures and his journeys on how he got started on becoming a, an entrepreneur, a home-based business. And he wants to share his knowledge and impart perhaps some wisdom to the audience. So I'll let him introduce himself and we'll go on from there. Hello. How are you? Um, thank you for having me on your show. I, I, I'm a big fan. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> okay. Um, so yes. tell us uh, who you are. Well, first of all, I am a father, grandfather, husband, entrepreneur, and a virtual speaker, okay. first of all. And uh, I, I love helping people uh, become great at what they are, who they are. You know, if, if anything, I can inspire someone to be great at who they are. That's what I love doing. I could agree with that. You have always been an inspiration to me and I mean, just introducing me to a whole new world when I was growing up and thinking of what I perhaps wanted to do in my adult years, I always thought about working for someone else, be it a nurse or um, secretary or, you know, lawyer, doctor, or what have you. But I always thought that my success would come in working for Fortune 500 company or some type of an establishment. But when I met you, you introduced me to the word entrepreneur. <laughs> and not only in the way of just by um, text or the word, but in the actual action. And I got to see entrepreneurship in real life. And I would say that you are the ultimate entrepreneur. So I have learned so much about being a business owner or um, self-motivated individual through you. So I appreciate that. You introduced me to the other side of the cash register, although I still use. <laughs> you use both of them. <laughs> Credit card. <laughs> yes. Although I'm still on the other side from time to time. So, um, yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit about your journey. I'll be happy to. Uh, it started when I was young. Um, I, You know what? I, I knew there was a better world out there for me. Uh, when I was living in Oakland, uh, I didn't want to live where I didn't have enough money to do what I wanted. I hated the word, I couldn't afford it. Okay. Matter of fact, I'm glad I heard it because it, it made me feel like it's something better out there, okay? And and still today, uh, my mother, she's in her 80s right now and God bless her. She had made me also uh, accountable for the things that I have today. Uh, but I broke through the glass ceiling for my family, you know, where I can't afford it, became I want it and I'm going to get it. Right. That's it. Right. So, right. So, right. Yes. Um, I understand that. Um, well, where did you get your inspiration from? I understand that you were, you know, perhaps living in a less than favorable environment. But where did you get your inspiration to want to break out of that environment? If I can interject here, I remember for me personally living in Oakland as well, um, it wasn't so bad. Our neighborhoods weren't that terrible, although, you know, they're deemed really bad now at the time, you know, living in Brookville, Sprenny Park, um, yeah. East Oakland and whatnot. But when I was coming up, that was considered city life. However, a change for me was when my family moved to um, the Valley, Lodi, California, and it was all predominantly Caucasian community and um, everything was just new and, you know, it was a new development and whatnot. And so I got a chance to see something different. So that is my question for you. Uh, was there anything like that that 
made a difference for you, something that you saw or someone that you knew that gave you the inspiration to want to do better, see better, know better? Yes, definitely. Um, when I was in my elementary uh, stage of life, I had a chance to uh, witness the nicer homes, the nicer cars, uh, people dressed up in suits going to work. I remember there was a gentleman that were, um, I'm on the bus and I'm looking over and I see them in their car where their, their shirt, their dress shirt is hanging in the back and you can see them with their tie on and they're going to work. And I'm like, I want that. I want, I felt good when I seen that. I felt that, uh, there was a better feeling for me in life than where I was. Once again, I wasn't happy in the situation I lived in. And I knew that I had to do something to change it. And, and I understood education was very important. So, yes, uh, uh, my friends may have been cutting school. And I got to say, I did cut school because I had a singing, singing thing that, uh, that bit me when I was younger, too. Um, but I knew that nothing was going to change unless I had that high school diploma to start things off. Mm -hmm. And when I look around back then, what inspired me even more was uh, being accountable for my actions and my mom held me to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a very strict mom and, you know, with six kids, a single mom, you know, she made sure the food was on the table. She made sure that, um, uh, uh, that we had soap. <laughs> People don't understand that soap is important. <laughs> to Tissue wash. paper, <laughs> yes. Oh, God, yes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't talk about those things, but that was important to me. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, yes. I have that habit. I love, I love making sure before I go to sleep, I make sure the dishes are clean. I make sure the floor is swept. Even today, that's instilled in me. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you know that for a fact. <laughs> I can't sleep unless the grass is cut outside, uh, the, the, you know, things like that. So at an early age, I knew in order for me to be better than what I was, I had to maintain a love and a passion for myself. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. So um, I can attest to that and agree with that. I think although we may have come from um, humble beginnings and humble backgrounds, there were still things that were instilled in us um, through grandparents and relatives, parents, and, and uh, a way of life that we had to follow through on, as, as you said, cleaning, um, cooking, sharing, taking care of family members, siblings, and things like that. We had these, um, I would say, expected rituals that we had to go through on a daily basis, which kept us busy and kept our minds focused on some things that were perhaps even more important than money or riches and what have you. So, um, and that, that builds that core foundation for us. And to add to that would be going out, venturing out and doing better than the generation before us yes. because they didn't always have the same means as are the things that are afforded to us the day and today and when we were coming up. Um, my parents were going to school and working as they were raising us. And now at this point in time, we are second generations of college educated um, people. And it wasn't as hard for our children and us as it was for them. And, and when they were first generations. So I can um, definitely understand that. So when did your journey first start with your entrepreneurship or your uh, self-development? Yes, that's a good question. I know it like it was uh, 
For me, it happened at an early age. I, I knew that being held accountable for what I did back then, I just loved to have, I always told my mom, look, I'm going to make sure that when I get old enough, I'm going to help with, you know, income that we were receiving because I hated the word. I can't afford it. So it made me want to go out and change that. So I went out and uh, I got a paper route at a young age and uh, she helped me on my paper route because I was, I was a softie click. When you click your, your monthly, uh, when people pay for the, you know, for the papers, uh, the subscription. Yeah. And there was one lady, I'll use it for an example. She didn't want to pay, so she gave me some cookies. And my mom went to her <laughs> and, and made sure that, she, you know, that she was accountable for that. Uh, but where it started was there, you know, that I can help out. And to see my mom smile on the face when I hand her uh, the little bit of money I made, and I wanted, to, I wanted to do more to just give it a little bit. So I just kept giving her more and more and more and more. And... Um, so, you know, I even took a different trips, you know, cruises, places that I knew that was just a, a dream to her. And, and hear what I would say about a dream. It becomes a fantasy if you do not take action to it, if you don't live through it. OK. And I want to make sure for her that was something that she because she always wanted to take a cruise. She always wanted to to uh, to go to Vegas, things like that. Uh she always talked about those things. I made those things possible for her. Um, but yes, way things turn around for me is being accountable, understanding that someone was held, holding me accountable for it. So uh, yeah. I have learned uh, at an early age that was one of my foundations, okay? And I picked a mentor, someone who had something that I wanted, okay? And I learned that if I was selling something and it was for ten dollars, uh, that's all I'm going to make on and that was my commission. OK, but I learned that if I had a larger commission, like a thousand to two thousand dollars or even five thousand dollars, I can sell and get a commission on that. I knew my income would change. Who was the mentor for you? Yes. My mentor was a gentleman by the name of James Tolton. It was uh, I bought this audio tapes. Uh, and he talked about, you know, there was a two sides to a cash register. And he said, when the price of bread or milk go up, he says, hey, let those prices go because it's a receiving end. Which side would you rather be on, the giving end or the receiving end? And he changed my mindset when I heard him talk about that. And then he mentioned, you know, hey, how much are you worth? And I thought about that. I go, hmm, well, how much I'm making an hour? That's what I, I came up. That was my answer. How much was I worth? And when a, when a company says you're only going to get paid uh, $10 an hour, I think my, when I first worked, it was like $1.65 and let you know how old I am, right? <laughs> for, for minimum wage. But, um, and then when you go to work, if they give you a raise, it could be five cents, it could be 10 cents. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm trapped. I'm, it's not enough. Now I really can't afford it. I'm listening to my mom. I'm like, wow, we can't afford it. <laughs> yeah, You're back there. <laughs> happened, okay, in my life, the way I looked at it, okay. So um, I want to make some real strong points that, that can help some people understand where they at, if you don't mind. Um, you need to you need to understand that don't let somebody tell you how much they're gonna pay you an hour. You need to be telling the person how much they should pay you. For your time. I started thinking like that. So I, in order to, to get there, I needed to what? Not only educate myself with, with the knowledge from, from books, like you see behind me, but, but I needed to be sure what I was learning, I was applying, and then it can show up in my life. Okay, far as financially. Okay. Every job I had, um, after that point of understanding that, uh, it wasn't like, okay, but somebody tell me, hey, Carl, I want to pay you for your time. How much How much are you going to charge? I'm going to say $1,000 an hour. Because a lot of things I've done, I have, I have struggled to learn, to understand. Mm -hmm. I paid money. I've been, I traveled to seminars, you know. I kept growing. I kept growing, okay? And um, I would say... 
no matter how old I am, I'm going to continue to grow. And I'm always going to have, I'm always going to look at mentors who have what I want. Mm. Okay. So I hope that answered your question there. Yes. So um, earlier you were speaking on a product costing $10 versus a product costing um, $1,000 perhaps or a sales for a sales pitch or whatever. Where were you going with that? Okay, thank you for asking. Uh, I want to clarify that. So um, you can spend two days trying to close a $10 product. Okay. Okay. And I found out those people, <laughs> it was harder to sell. Because their mindset was, I'm not going to give you any money because I don't know what you, you know, they're going to make up all these excuses, right? And and I always tell a person, excuse the well thought I lie. But anyway, um, but when I got what people who are buying a $1,000 product, okay, or a $5,000 product, those were different types of people. Mm. You know, their mindset was, hey, um, I'm going to tell you what I need. And that's another thing. This is the tip too. Write this down, folks. Don't try to sell something. Find out what a person wants. Find out what they need at the time that they want to buy it. And guess what? They will pay for it. And that changed. That also was a thing that changed things in my life. You know, my close ratio went up from you know. 10, 20% to 60, 80% at times, sometimes even 90% because I always find out what a person wants. So you have, you have to ask certain questions to get there. Okay. So pretty much is um, not trying to sell them anything, but finding out what they need and they will come to you. Yeah. And why they need it. Why they need it was a big point too. Hmm. You know? Why is that? Is it why they? Why do you need to know why they need it? Because that's going to help you get, help them get into why they need it, get into their imagination, what they're going to do with it when they have it. I always ask the questions. Okay, so let's say you have that. What, what that's going to do? How that's going to change your life? Okay, and when you find those those answers, it's easy for you to let them tell you, uh, talk themselves into buying whatever you have. Hmm. Okay. okay. You know, you know, like it's almost like this, and what it is that you want before you pursue that particular person to buy what you have. If you find out what that person likes, and then perhaps you can come from a different perspective, as in um, finding out what what makes them happy, and thereby um, perhaps leaning more toward giving the person what they enjoy versus what you want. Yeah, target marketing. Um, when you're out selling anything or, or trying to acquire a, a customer, you need target, target marketing. So let's say, for instance, if you are selling a house, so a high ticket product, right? You just don't want to say, hey, here's just the best house for you. Just, you know, you're going to love it, but you don't even know what they love. Right. You have to ask the right kind of questions. People will walk in the home and you watch them. They'll let you know. They'll use their imagination. Oh, this is where my bedroom, my bed is going to be in this room. Oh, you can just tell if that person likes the home. You have to be connected with them. With anything that you're feeling or presenting, you have to be connected to the individual to find out if this is what they want. Because if not, the next day they're going to be counseling that sale. Yeah, buyer's remorse. Exactly. So that's the way around that. And also customer service. Uh, what I found out that changed my life was when you give the person what they want, you need to follow up the next day. Hmm. A follow up is very important after a sale. Okay. okay. Uh, yes. These techniques here. Uh, so you, you need to understand um, what to say when you do a follow up. Right. You need to listen to them, if they seem excited, talking about, oh man, I, I enjoyed yesterday, or oh man, I just can't wait till I get in there. I can't wait till I drive that. I can't wait till I read that material. I can't wait till I go to the seminar, whatever it is, or our product that they they're buying, like clothes or whatever. 
you have to make sure that that is so, you know, that whatever you gave them is something that they really want with passion, desire. OK, that if you try to take it away from them, they're going to say, uh-uh, I'm going to pay you twice for it. Right. You have to have that feel. So you- it's like um, what Maya Angelou said. Mm-hmm. It's pretty much how you made them feel. Thank you. It's not what you said, but how they felt about what you said. And they would feel about, you know what, when I go to the grocery store, even today, um, I, I tried something. And you guys probably want to try this too. I, 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 asked, um, I asked the lady, you know, they're going to ask me first. They're going to say, uh, um, did you find everything you need, sir? You know what I tell them? I go, no, I didn't find what I need. And you know what? <laughs> the next day I, I come in the store, she won't forget me. <laughs> oh, how you doing? Did you f- oh yeah, how you doing then, Mr. Douglas? Oh, blah blah blah. And, and it happens. It's a test. I, I mm-hmm. use that. Okay. And and it, it why do you think that works? Why do you think that works? Because people's when you surprise them with something that they're not used to hearing. Okay. They won't forget. Okay. So Mm-hmm. Typically, they just ask the question as remotely, kind of random, or or just being taught. Yeah, it's what their boss tell them to do, right? Oh, you, right, uh, right. That's a, well, sir, did you find everything you like? And everybody <laughs> going, yeah, thank you, right? Yes, yes, but, yes. You, know, you get up to have a stern look on your face, like I'm unhappy. I didn't <laughs> what I was looking for. They are not going to forget. You. And the same thing in the conversation, I'm using it for an example, same thing in the conversation, when you talk to somebody, you have to let them get in their imagination to, to, to tell you what they look for and what they're going to do with it when they get it. And and they're thinking, yeah, this can't. already they, they like you and they're going to like you more because it's all about you or the listener. People are paying, paying money right now, um, paying money right now just for somebody just to listen to them. Because a lot of people don't listen to people. Absolutely. There's Absolutely. A, I can see that. Yeah, there's a friend of mine who had a service where he he had an 800 number. People just call just so they can talk. Sure. That's sure. it. You know, most, most psychiatrists, that's what they do. They sit down and, and let you talk. Right, right. Very I simple. guess that's true because so many people are all wanting to talk and share and share together. So there's not a lot of listeners. The other day I was on a call and one of the um, speakers was saying that there was so much value in silence. And mm-hmm. I thought, hmm, because usually when there's silence, if you know, take the silence says right now, just don't say anything. You mm-hmm. don't say anything, I won't say anything. That's yes, right. Mm-hmm. See, you, didn't, you weren't silent. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Take the sound test. Don't say okay. anything. But I heard, it was, I heard myself thinking. That's you heard I, yourself thinking. Yeah. Well, what they were saying is that, you know, there is there is a value to silence because we're all so used to talking that it becomes uncomfortable to be silent. And mm-hmm. so I thought, huh, yeah, it is. If after a little while, um, sometimes you can't even think, you know, you have to have your questions prompt or, or you have to have it prepared because you don't want a, a interruption of silence, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it's a good thing that you said, you can hear yourself think, but mm-hmm. yeah, we need to be comfortable with being silent. Yeah. So Basically, you you had this upbringing and things were kind of rough and you decided that that's not the way you wanted to go in your life. You saw some examples. You saw other people, especially men, uh, that you were driving cars and had their suit jackets hanging in the window and ties on. And you thought about their professional life and you said pretty much that that was the life that you wanted to have. For almost like pursuing, um, what was that? Pursuing happiness uh, with Will Smith. Yes. Is, is it pursuing happiness? Yeah. I think so. Yeah, I think you got it right. Mm-hmm. Yes, and he's, uh, you know, he saw another side of the street, and he wanted to be on the opposite side of the street. You know, so um, 
when all of those things took place and you started to see things go in a different direction, you thought you valued education and you knew that getting a high school diploma was uh, your ticket out of your circumstance and environment. Um, when did that next uh, journey or turnaround happen for you? What, what was the, the defining moment? Yes. Well, I went in the service. Okay. I became a, uh, you know, I was stationed in Hawaii and I got a chance to meet a gentleman. He was sitting on the park bench and he was, you know, when you see homeless people, don't be fooled. These people are educated. These people somewhere on the, their life that they decided to give up, you know, marriages and uh, their responsibility. They want to get off the radar. So this one particular person, I, I, I used to sit next to him and we used to have these very strong conversations. And one thing he told me, he says, if you want to be a millionaire, because that's what I always had in my mind, I wanted to be a millionaire. So what would that look like? Uh, better home, better house, all that good stuff, right? But he said, if you want to be a millionaire, find a millionaire that will teach you. And when hmm. he, he teach you, do what he does. Just copy what he does, because he already, he, and that's a shortcut, okay? And he said, fine. He said, find something that nobody wants that you can sell in high volume. And I did. How would you be able to sell something that no one wants? Well, let's, let me use this one example. Uh, there was a clothing store that sold, what actually manufactured, they sold Hawaiian shirts. The guy was going out of business. He had thousands of these things just sitting in the warehouse. He just wanted to get out of the business. And he gave me some samples. He says, Carl, if you can find somebody that, that wants to buy this, I'll give you a finder's fee. That's what I'm using as an example, and I did. I found somebody very quickly. Uh, I just put two people together, and I had to find a fee. I said, "Oh, that was some easy money." Okay. So what you mean? So you don't mean to say that find something that nobody wants? You find something that perhaps someone is trying to rid themselves of, or something that perhaps they don't want it, but somebody else wants it. Yes, it's so something he didn't want. He went out of the business. Right. Okay. So he was, he was exiting his business. And you needed somebody perhaps who was either in business or someone who was starting a business. Yeah. I found somebody in Animal Wanda Shopping Plaza that wanted to buy his stuff. Okay. And I put them two together. I was there when they did the transaction and I got to find it for you on that same day. And right. interesting enough, I took that money and bought me a car for cash. Wow. You know, so that lets me know, let me know that there's a better way of making money than a nine to five. OK, venture right there started with the blowout center, which you are very familiar with. Blind, buying stuff and selling to like food for less, being a representative to sell stuff to, um, you know, here, here's step two. You got to take notes. What I found out was there there are teacher companies out there, manufacturer, teacher manufacturers. Of IRs, they can't sell that to their their clients because their clients want first first quality. So what they do with the IRs, they put them in the corner there, and it's taking up space. What I did, I found companies like that that had IRs and other different material, different things. I would take that and I, would, I found out there was a chain of discount stores that would buy that from me if I find the product for them. Right, I can warehouse anything. All I needed to do is take the sample, send it to them. They'll go ahead and pay me the difference. So if, say for instance, the shirt was two dollars, okay? Uh, that the, they were retailing it for or three dollars. I went to them and said, "Hey, I'll buy everything. All that is IR. I'll, I'll give you fifty cents for it. I'll give you a quarter for it." Sometimes when things are bought right, it's halfway sold already, okay? And okay. so I went ahead and I took it to Gulf Fleet Market, you know, and I had a gentleman who had a contract with Nike. And he said, oh man, I take all the RRs you, you can give me. And and I never had to worry about something that, that I couldn't sell if it came to t-shirts and he bought containers with loads of stuff, okay? So, so that is one of the things I, I kind of found that kind of changed my life. Uh, and if, if you don't mind, I, I'll mention another one. Um, I went back to working nine to five 
Because I promise you, if something didn't go through, remember, <laughs> I was going to go to a nine to five. And I did. And I hated it. The point where I used to pull over in the car and throw up. Because it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Somebody tell me how much they're going to pay me an hour. I couldn't take it. Okay? Even though in that company, I broke all sales records. To the point where they got mad at me. And they wanted to fire me. Because you know, I'm talking about I don't want to mention any names on, on the air, but um, they wanted to fire me because in a year time working for the company, I went from just a salesperson to a master representative with just making almost two hundred thousand dollars a year. And that was crazy in one year. And you know, the reason why they wanted to fire me, uh, and it, it was no reason to fire me, they just didn't like me. Okay, Be because I made them look bad. So, and, and some of you watching this right now are probably saying, hey, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I got people who think about it. How many people at your job who are younger than you are, are older than you are trying to fire you, no matter how much work you put in? It, it, it can destroy your mind. Okay? Mm -hmm. You can. It can it, you can stay in the bed and say, I'll forget it. I give up. But you can't. Because why? Because you're trapped in all these bills. And, uh, but, but that particular company taught me something. They... <laughs> You remember what happened after I quit that company? No. I would go to the mall and travel and sell school education. Oh, yeah. And I mm -hmm. took that company right there. Uh, I'll mention the name of the company. It was called Your Golden Education. And that changed my life, too. Uh, having the booth in the mall and going on that, that journey. And, and life is a journey. When I stopped thinking about... Uh, just working nine to five, and and I knew that I, my self worth needed to, to go up. So I, I made sure that reading a lot of books, you know, it gave me uh, the education I needed to share with other people and help other people strive for better and best. You know, get into their greatness. Uh, what gave you that high spirited drive to take on the challenges of? selling or engaging with other people because a lot of people have a lot of fear when it comes to approaching other people. Yeah. Just the fact that I knew if, if I can master engaging with people that I'll be able to go anywhere with anything and make the money that if that's what I wanted to do, I can train people to do what I do. And I have done that too in the past. My close ratio on engagement went up from, like I said, 30% on to at, at times 90%. Okay. Uh, because I, I, I learned to understand how to get a person to, to like you right away. Now you only get seconds, sometimes maybe five seconds on the internet, maybe three seconds to, and to get somebody to want to see more of whatever you're trying to talk about. So you're saying that the key to engaging others is to get them to like you within a short period of time. It, it's a formula to it. It is. It's a formula that you need to master and understand. And to get that formula, you need to go to people like myself who have years of training myself, getting so many no's, no, I'm going to get out of my face, whatever. I've learned to master, completely master that technique. A lot of people on the internet don't really master that personal one on one connection with an individual. Right. Well, um, I guess I'm speaking more of a personal engagement because on the internet, that's a different beast compared to when you are face to face or let's say on that elevator. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's pretty much what I'm talking about. Well, well here, I got to correct you on that because it is the same understanding. It's trimmed down a little bit because on the internet, they don't see, you, they read. It's the thing we have called power of words, okay? Words have so much power. Video, you know, when a person sees you on the video, they want to feel you. They want to feel that they can trust you because that's the next thing. After they like you, they got to feel they can trust you, okay? That's on the internet, okay? Um, 
I like to get a person on Facebook on the phone. Why? Because I can find out, I can feel them as well as they can feel me. And and I got to tell you, the difference between those who are making $200 a month or maybe in a week, are they lucky? To making thousands a week and tens of thousands at the end of the month is understanding the formula of attraction. It's a science too. It's a science too. And, and no matter where I go, or what I do, I got to tell you, um, <laughs> I will use my formula and it works pretty much each and every time. Where can I walk to a strange city and go out door knocking and, and come back with a whole stack of leaves like I do? It's, it's a formula and I use. One, one lead can be, and you think about this, a personal life sheet, if you have one lead, they're going to be buying from you over and over and over. Because why? They like you and they trust you. But you still need to be an example. You still need to show them your track record that what you do, okay, definitely does work. Okay, so a person needs to be able to trust you. And uh, you like to be able to trust the individual that you're working with and you make some type of personal connection mm -hmm. and, or as far as, um, but I think your point, you made my point by stating that the internet is the same, but you still kind of go back to having that personal connection with people. Yes. So the words are powerful, but being having that one on one or not necessarily the one on one, but having that uh, co physical connection of some mm -hmm. sort, as in talking or um, visually seeing someone mm -hmm. makes it more personable and more real and um, I think more of a winning prospect. Yeah, and you know they just they, a lot of people in the internet are are just now trying to find that out. They they say, okay, give me a let's set up a formula for you. They'll have a funnel, and, and then they go through the funnel. Then they say, oh, and then the funnel here, make an appointment, and we'll give you a call. They'll set up a time where you'll do that, and you and it's still that connection. They found out that the connection is more important. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and it goes through a, a series of tests. Okay, and I, and I got to truly say, there's a science behind it, and they just now starting to find out about that. But I've been doing this for a long time, and I got to tell you, that is what's working right now. I can take I can take people right now and show them without talking or giving too much away. Show them how they can go out and set up a booth somewhere with my training, and and get these that can lead to one lead can lead to thousands of dollars. It truly can, okay? And they'll be able to sell that person over and over and over again if they follow a simple technique that I have learned from. Mm -hmm. And I put it together myself. From, you know, I learned it myself. Um, I'm going to use this for an example as far as technique. Again, as you know, I work for a company called Lyft. And Lyft was a rideshare company that... You were you were paid a commission when you were able to get new drivers for them, and and I was an ambassador for Lyft, and my job was to go out and get new drivers. Okay. okay. And my close ratio was pretty high, close to a little bit over 85 percent, and a lot of people couldn't do what I was able to do. Uh, because I knew only had so much time to close that individual. And I got to say, it it definitely, what I've learned in the past, definitely was able to get me uh, the skills I needed to make that happen. That was another true test of what I have for and skills and what I can teach other people. Um, I think the most I made in that particular, well, I know the most I made was $8,000 in one week. Okay, and my weekly check was was always five or in, in those numbers, 
okay, 5,000 feet, and it stays steady until they went up. So, but I got to say, uh, successful people eat blues, and I have to say that was one of my success. And I can use another one, a real quick example. I worked for another company called Rolling Hills. It was probably one of the biggest, I would say, biggest uh, test for me because what the product was. Yeah. Okay. And the product, and I'll tell you right away what it was. It was um, Rolling Hills was a, a, a cemetery that showed plots. And these plots are, are you have plots they call advanced planning. Okay, and I was in the advanced planning department where people buy plots for just in case I would pass and like everybody needs it, right? We all would die, right? But you know what? Here's the interesting part. It was the hardest thing for me because when I first my challenge was to kill people, right? And I gotta tell you, I was feeling. I was feeling they were about ready to fire me. <laughs> you know, I'm like, fire me. So I went and looked in the mirror and I talked to myself and I said, no, you're going to figure this thing out. And I figured it out and I did something that nobody ever did in the history of that particular company, which was one of the um, the fourth largest companies when I was there, uh, Forest and Cell, fourth largest and Cell. But when I was there, they became the um, And what I figured out was this. Um, I needed to make sure I closed the person right then and there. So my closing skills got even better. So I did something that they felt was impossible. I got people who were in the mall to think about buying a plot the same day, and I closed them on the same day. They couldn't believe that was possible. And I, and I went through the wrong, and I ended up closing three people on one so what I did, I was able to, to hone my skills there on on my close ratio, my percentage of close. Like I said, it was a challenge. And who wants to talk about death? Who wants to talk about you know buying plots when they're in the mall? They're in the mall to buy clothes. Right. But I was able to have the highest percentage of clothes than anybody in the whole United States. And they helped me as the number one salesperson in the United States. Wow. So because of my because of the techniques and that I've learned and that I will share with anybody who's interested. Gotcha. Uh, well, I remember that. I remember um, it being pretty dynamic for you and, and closing on the same day. I guess for them, they were really about the lead base, perhaps mm -hmm. getting the leads first, and then perhaps um, trying to get a manager to close for them. Mm -hmm. Perhaps mm -hmm. that you were taking on your own closes and and having that personal relationship with the individual. Where I remember where mm -hmm. they did not want to close if you weren't there. Um, they didn't want to close with your boss or your superior they wanted to close with you. So yeah, I think that that connection makes all the difference. Yeah, I know it does for me when I'm doing what I do, which is interview authors and publishers as well. And I found that a lot of authors and illustrators are very, very intimidated and well, let's say not intimidated, but very introverted and very shy and a lot of them don't like a lot of attention. However, they do work that gets a lot of attention. So yeah, I, and when I speak with them and make them feel more comfortable uh, getting them on the phone right away or whatever, then they are really uh, less intimidated and feel very comfortable with coming onto the platform and sharing what they do. But yeah, I, th I think that connection is very powerful. Yes, I agree. So what are the success rates with online businesses and um, or why do most people fail in online businesses? What I found out is it's 80 percent of people fail. Okay. okay. And the reason why 80%, they, that's yeah, really a 
large it, amount of people it failing. It is. But you know what? <laughs> but if you look at the track record, 1,700 millionaires are created uh, in business, period. Okay, a, a day. That's how many mean that that's the United States and it could be triple in, in the world. Why? Because a lot of people are making a lot of money online. And the reason why I feel that a lot of people fail because they get into something they give up before they succeed. Okay. If you want to be better at something or, or succeed in anything, you need to work hard at it. Everything I, I talked about, I worked hard. I figured out. I mean, I have failure days, but but it didn't stay that way because I figured it out. I, when you stay in something long enough, you will figure it out. I believe that, um, like for you right now, you have you have a whole bunch of books. You have what six books now? Why you were able to do it because you didn't see failure as an option. All you you seen was success. Oh, I'm gonna finish this book. It wasn't even a thought. You've depended on yourself and you made it happen. I think what people need to do, stop depending on other people. Yes, absolutely. Stop watching all the videos and become a professional video watcher. Okay? Then you need to understand that you need to get started. Don't listen to those, those, those people tell you, oh, you're going to fail. You know, now when they say that, say, oh, I'm glad I'll fail because guess what? I'm going to keep on trying. I think that you make a good point because um, you can watch a lot of videos and go through a lot of courses that can talk you into getting into it. And you can equally find videos that can talk you out of it and places and, and um, programs that will help you get out of the same thing that you were trying to get into. So, yeah, yeah you, perhaps before you get to the point of bailing out, maybe you should just take that leap of faith and jump right into what it is you're trying to accomplish. Right. And stop making excuses for yourself. Yes. The other thing people do, they make excuses. And did you believe it? Because I would say another 80% of people talk themselves out of going forward. I can, I can believe that. I mean, Thoughts come into my head every day. I mean, or a new idea of a new, and it may be excellent ideas, but as soon as they pop in, I might say, oh, someone else is already doing that, or oh, that would take too much time, or I'm not really interested in that, or, or something. So, yes, it, if you're looking at excuses being in that type of manner, Yes, excuse can be a thought out lie that you you're telling yourself, um, and it might even be valid. Maybe it's just not a time for you. I know time is is a factor. Timing is great because I would not be an author at the moment had it not have been for this perfect timing. I've always wanted to venture into it and become an author, but I just didn't have the time. I didn't even know. Uh, what I wanted to write about or, or anything like that. But once you dabble into something or once you take that leap, once you take that leap of faith, you'll be surprised that as the word said, God makes room for your gifts and you will end up finding that right door to walk through. So you do have to know your reason and jump for your reason and not be afraid. Yes. Make your faith bigger than your fear. Absolutely. So I have to agree with you on that. I never really thought about it in that manner because I'm sure we wake up with brilliant every day, a dream, a beautiful thought and we don't act on it always. So, yes. I uh, don't know if there's anything else that you'd like to say or contribute or uh, remind the audience of, but um, if you do, this would be a perfect time to just kind of impart some more wisdom to the audience before we go. Well, it's always interesting to conclude something about 
uh, what do you want? That's the question I ask. Do you know who you are? Okay. You need to know who you are and why you're doing what you're doing. I think that's the first step. And I want to conclude on that. Know who you are and why you're and why you are doing or pursuing what you are pursuing. Yes. And if you know these things, then that will give you the motivation to continue to push forward and make that dream a success. Yes. Definitely. Okay. Well, thank you very much for being on the show. I'm just um, happy to have had you here and I'm sure you will be back. <laughs> so to the audience, I hope that we have given you something to go on and some seeds to grow from. Thank you all for listening. It's been a fabulous opportunity. Thank you, dear. Thank you for I love it. Thank you for having me.